What up guys, this is Characters, what's going on, and welcome back to How to Master 6 Max Zoom. Um, we're taking a little bit of a break from PowerPointing today. It's almost Christmas, you know, so you can forgive me for not wanting to create a big massive PowerPoint with lots of cool visuals and graphics for you guys. I'd rather actually address something that we do have to deal with at some point in this series that we've not really touched upon fully yet, which is the amount of variance um, that you're going to encounter when you play 6 Max Zoom. Um, like 6 Max, regular 6 Max that is, is still a very swingy game. It always has been. It's been more and more swingy in recent recent years because the games have got tougher and win rates have got smaller, BB per 100 that is. Um, and for that reason, a lot of people have started to turn to games like Zoom where they're not actually banking on having a really high BB per 100. They're actually banking on having a very high hourly <coughs> because they can put in a lot of hands per hour and thus multiply what would normally be a small hourly at a slower pace game, such as a slow site where you're only like playing three tables of regular. And just to give you guys a flavor, if you're playing like six max zoom, you're probably playing, if you're four tabling six max zoom, which is something that I do believe that every serious zoom player should be able to reach the capacity to be able to do at some point. If you're four tabling, you're probably playing over a thousand hands an hour, maybe like 1100 hands an hour, 1200, something like that quite easily, depending on how quickly you fast fold, you can also in in increase your own hourly in zoom just by fast folding quicker and getting more hands in per hour, um, but that is just immense, if you're someone who's playing like three tables of regular stakes, um, where you're having to wait obviously after you folded for the next hand, you're not just getting instantly dealt in, which is the advantage of zoom pace wise, then you're going to be playing about 200 hands an hour, um, and that's just really, really slow at six times slower, so even if your win rate was six times larger playing regular, which is a pretty tall ask, the thought is that you're still going to make more, you're going to make the same amount of money by playing Zoom, and probably your win rate is not six times greater playing three tables of regular stakes, although it will be substantially, maybe two or three times um, greater, I would think. So that's the idea with Zoom, we're willing to embrace the small BB per 100 for a higher hourly, that's the sort of ethos if you like, of the Zoom grinder, that's the sacrifice or the trade-off that we're willing to make when we choose to play this game as our format. But in the process, we're also willing to accept that variance is going to be much higher and it's going to be harder mentally, emotionally, and it's just going to be difficult to keep our head in the game and play well for sustained periods of time because we're running bad for for what feels like, well, what is actually a longer stretch hand-wise. Um, because and the, the swings will feel a lot more brutal as well like once you can have like easily minus 10 buy-in sessions in Zoom, for instance, if you're playing like two or 3k sessions, whereas it's unlikely that you're going to rack up that many hands in regular, so at least the downswings feel a bit more drawn out. That could be a good or a bad thing, depending on your mental game and the types of tilt that you have. So what I want to do today is just show you guys exactly what you should expect variance-wise. Um, I want to get into your head that what you may consider to be a reasonable sample or a sample that you may be using to base your progress on. And I mean, your actual skill progress, like how you're doing in the game, could well be too small and simply unjustified due to the level of variance operational over that sample. Let's look at this. I mean, this is a sample that a lot of you guys may consider very large. And indeed, at regular stakes where win rates are pretty high, if you're winning at 7, 8, 9 BB per 100, this, win rate, um, this sample is pretty big and you will expect to win almost all the time. I would think, playing this sample with that kind of win rate. Um, not always, but certainly most of the time. In Zoom, however, win rates are a lot smaller. And this win rate here is 3.32 BB per 100. Most of this is Zoom. It's not all Zoom. There's some regular um, thrown in here as well. It's just basically a recent sample from me. Um, I've not been playing that much this year, as you guys probably know who have been following my videos, because I've been mainly coaching and writing my book. But I have been playing a bit, and this is just the last whatever many hands I have on this. This is all the hands I have on this database on this computer, basically. Um, since I lost a bunch of hands before that. So 130k is a sample that if you show your poker peers, they're likely to say, yeah, that's a big sample, well done, this win rate's reliable over this sample. Um, but what I want to say today is that this is actually not, I don't actually know that my true win rate in these games, 50NL Zoom, this is, by the way, pretty much exclusively, is 3.32 BB per 100, which I consider definitely a very respectable Zoom win rate. But I don't know that it's that high. I don't know if it's a bit lower, a bit higher than this, it could be very different. Just look at the swings here. I mean, you're talking about like here, going down from 1400, that's obviously the 28 um, by an upswing right there. 
crashing down to minus 600. I mean, that's a 40, that's a 2k um, downswing, basically, right here, over the space of like 9,000 hands. Is that right? Yeah, that's like a 2k downswing. Some of that might be hundreds, I'm not sure. I don't think so, though. I think this is mostly 50s. Anyway, extreme gross upswings and downswings, like much more than you're used to seeing at normal stakes. Like there's just a 20 by in downswing, just normal standard run of the mill downswing. This one's like bigger. This is like almost like 30 to 40. Um, huge, like huge upswings, huge downswings. This graph is not very stable, break even period towards the end. That's whatever. Just another example of variance running out over a small sample. But you can expect this to be very volatile, basically. Like, you imagine starting off on your grind and getting to here and having a short-sighted idea of variance and playing 9k hands, or whatever this is at this point in time on the graph. You not tell me if I hover over it, no? Um, okay, well, it looks like about, about sort of 12k or something. Anyway, so I'm being up, like, $1,600 of being like, I am a crusher. My win rate is, like, 26 BB per 100 or some ridiculous amount that's going to be over that win rate. Sorry, guys, that's my mobile phone which is kind of kind of rude let me just tell that to shut up no one actually no one loves me it's just a, an alarm that i set myself in case i wasn't up by this ridiculous time in the afternoon which is always a, a possibility with the poker professional you never really have a schedule so you know well you do with coaching but generally speaking i teach people in the afternoon and the evening so i can kind of get up whenever i like kind of blessing and a curse anyway so this is if you are trapped in this kind of the delusion, the box of short of short sightedness, as I call it, like when you don't have a good enough appreciation of variance, what's going to happen is that you'll get to here and be like, "I'm a crusher. Look how well I'm doing." You'll show off your graph. You'll say, "I am a professional poker player. I am making a bunch of money," and you'll build up this false illusion of yourself as being this great player who just has to win all the time. You might feel invincible. You might feel like you know, I'm probably running a bit good just now, but clearly I'm crushing the game. Well, guess what? You may well not be even be a winner. Very volatile game and very easy over this kind of sample um, to actually have this kind of a... This must be 100 at the start. It's just way too swingy. I don't know. Not sure, actually. But anyway, it's, it's very easy to have this kind of... Um, these kind of peaks and troughs um, and even have this much of a peak that's like a 20... No, it's more than that. It's like a sort of 30 by an upswing. And you can do that, assuming this is 50 and L, you can do that even being a losing player or whatever. So then you crash and then you end up in this, what we call the newbie cycle of death, circle of death rather, where you're kind of just, you did think that you were a crusher, but that led to so much false confidence that now you're in total disarray. Now you think you've done something wrong. Suddenly, oh, I was crushing. Now I'm getting completely crushed. What have I done? My game's falling apart. You start changing things. You start making over adjustments. You lose all your confidence. You start doing things you'd never do before. Emotions start making your decisions. Fear of health sets in. You begin to just call the river when you know you should value raise because you're so afraid of your opponent having that one combo of the nuts. Um, all this kind of th all this kind of stuff. You start playing against fears of hands specifically and not whole ranges. This kind of thing, and then you start actually damaging your win rate and actually having a lower expectation. But that shouldn't have happened because we don't yet know how well you're going to do. And it's quite possible that if I hadn't tilted so much, which I probably did at this point, I probably made this worse than it had to be, then I could be up here and have a have one more money over the sample. It's also very possible that um, if I controlled my tilt very well here, which I may have done, I don't remember, then the, the average grinder who has a worse mental game would be down here somewhere. The point is that by having a true appreciation of what variance is and a realistic idea of it, you can actually, it helps your mental game a lot, helps remind yourself like that you're in this for the long run, you're in this for the, the long haul, you're not just, you know, every time you have a crushing 20k hands or a terrible 10k hands, it doesn't mean that you're doing amazingly or playing terribly respectively. So what I want to do today is play some poker, of course, um, and I want to show you guys like a little study aid that I would use for working on the mental game and appreciating variance in this highly volatile game, and I'm going to fill the fourth space on my screen that you guys will be accustomed to seeing filled with some non-lively non thing, because I'm 3 tabling, it's the best pace of video I feel for Zoom 4, it's a bit chaotic, speaking at the same time, although it is what I would grind normally. Um, I'm going to fill that up with a, a sort of variance-based aid to remind myself of what I should expect over big samples. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start off with this 130k sample in a variance calculator, and I'm going to show you guys with the same win rate and looking at my standard deviation, which actually we can probably 
we can probably find just by doing a player report over this sample. I'll show you guys how to do this in Poker Tracker actually find your own standard deviation. What you want to do is go to player report, um, just say finish. You can choose like positional report if you go next there. There are a bunch of other options. Um, but basically, you can see here on the left hand side of the screen in Poker Tracker, we've got all these stats. We've got the search bar, which is what you're normally going to use. And you can just type, type standard deviation, my currency standard deviation, or my, what one do I want? Game currency standard deviation. I think I want BB per 100. I think that's the normal measure of it. Yeah, okay. So that's pretty high 85.69. I mean, I think standard deviations in regular games are usually a lot um, a lot lower than this. In Zoom, they're higher. There's just less information. All the reasons that I spoke about at the beginning of the series, why variance is higher in Zoom. So we're going to actually plug that into our variance calculator at 85.69. So we're going to go here. And this is a place called Pokerope on the internet. It's pretty cool. Apparently now it has online Chinese poker, which excites me very much because I love that game. Such a degen. It's a really fun game to play, Chinese poker. Try it out if you want to like degen away your, your Christmas holidays instead of making money at the tables. Good idea. From characters, the poker instructor, or just play actual poker that you can have a good edge at instead um, if you want to make money. So win rate and BB per 100, we're going to plug in what that was in Poker Tracker. I don't quite remember. Um, we can find this here as well, though you can type BB per 100, which is the stat here. Double click it, it goes right into the report. Always good to know how to use Poker Tracker for get the most out of this very powerful tool. It doesn't crash all the time. I add that because Holder Manager is a very powerful tool as well, only it crashes and it freezes up all my students' computers and makes them rage and makes our sessions less efficient because we have to waste time trying to get Holder Manager to work. So go for Poker Tracker, seriously. It's a better piece of kit all, all around. Sorry if there's any Holder Manager fans out there, but that's kind of how I feel, so I'm just being honest about what I think the best software is. So we're going to plug in 3.32 and 85.69 into this here. So 3.32 win rate, observe win rate. We are not going to include that, basically. That's not relevant for our purposes because we're just going to try and churn out a bunch of samples at that win rate with that deviation over the hand sample in question. I'm going to say 130... What was it? 130, 100 hands. And we're going to put in our standard deviation of 85.69, I believe it was. So then we're going to say calculate. What this will basically do, by the way, is tell you how, how likely you are to actually fall within, how likely the observed win rate is to fall within an actual win rate. It's like a measure of how often you will actually run better or worse than the observed win rate. Um, given the true win rate over a certain sample. So we hit calculate here and what it does is it churns out a bunch of data for us down here in a nice graph form. So what happened here, here we've got the amount of BBs that I actually won over this sample which if we go to back to our graph here we can see, um, we can actually put this graph if we want instead of seeing my currency we can put that into big blinds um, to see how many big blinds we actually made over this sample and that will be good for us comparing this. So here we made 4,400 BBs. Which is to say basically 40.4 um, or 44 buy-ins rather. Okay, so how are we doing then on average? Obviously this is going to be like the median because that's what happened and that's the true win rate. So here we have like the 4.44, it's like the median where this black line is basically. Um, that shows the average spread here and what you're expected to get on average. The lines either side of it show the good and bad fluctuations that happen, the ones above this, and this is your 50% like, your confidence interval as it were, and these are, the, these are the lines that are better than this, these are the ones that are worse than this obviously. And you can see here that you may think the sample is big, but with this win rate and this standard deviation, it's not that big. And out of 20 samples here, we'll ignore these ones, these are like the best and worst over a thousand trials, so they're a lot more, uh, a lot less random. They're not likely to show up if you just run 20 samples. Um, but you can see here that there are lines that are just barely breaking even. There's two lines here that have won basically like 265, 165 BBs and stuff like that, or even just six buy-ins or two buy-ins in sample 16 there. Um, we don't have any losers over the sample, but if we keep generating this, we will get some losers. These 20, you can see that um, there's a fairly even spread here. We don't have anything like totally close to break even, but you see the point. I could have done 
so well that I was up basically almost double what I was up there, or I could have been up like a tiny fraction of it. And if you look at what the true win rate actually would be there for an infinite sample with that standard deviation of making that amount of money proportionally to the amount of hands. So, I mean, if I was to take this and ask Poker Tracker what my win rate was for having a result like this pink line here instead, it would tell me it was a very, very small win rate indeed, like point one of a BB or something like that, whatever that would be, maybe 0.2 of a BB per 100, much, much smaller than the actual win rate that was observed in that sample that I just showed you guys. So it just goes to show that all of these things could have happened over that sample. I could have played 130k hands and barely done better than breaking even, which would be really depressing, but it wouldn't mean that I wasn't better than that as a player. Similarly, I could have done this well and it wouldn't mean that I was actually this good as a player. Who knows? Maybe the sample that we saw in my graph could, I'd like to think it's not, but could potentially just be one of these ones that I'm running really good with a lesser win rate, and actually I'm expected to break even in the game with the variance being neutral. Maybe I'm a crusher and my win rate's actually up here somewhere, but I ran really bad and then got that win rate. The point is, we just don't know, and that's a huge sample in terms of what people commonly talk about as huge samples. It's not actually a big sample, 130k hands, but people think it is. And it just goes to show that if you have a lesser sample, and if you're one of these guys that's basing your progress over like a 30k sample, um, you're basically just deluding yourself into thinking that you've got any kind of reliable data or that you know that you're a winner or whatever. You just don't. You have to improve your game. That's why goals should be progress orientated. Like I said in my most recent podcast for Grinder Skill, um, we should be thinking about how to improve our game, how to improve our win rate, and the actual realization of that win rate and the money over a small sample is not anything we can control and it's not something we can do anything about. Here's a really bad one. We just generated another 20 and we've got, look at this ridiculous sample here, this pink line. We're up like at the, at the peak here, like 91 and we have this 40 buy in downswing just over the last sort of like 30k hands. And that's someone who's winning in the game. That's just what can happen. Variants can do that to you. It doesn't, he's not done anything wrong. These are not people who are tilting. This is just a robotically generated sample. These lines don't represent tilt making anything any worse. It's not that sophisticated. You know, these are literally, if if I if this happens to a human, this is going to be much worse because they're going to tilt as well if they lose 40k. Almost regardless of who they are, they'll tilt to some extent. Um, so, yeah, you, you guys are getting the picture now. It's very difficult to know exactly how well you're doing. You've even, we've even got a losing, a very bad losing line here. This poor sod here is winning at 3.32 BB per 100 over 130,000 hands, yet has lost... 2,500 big blinds. It's crazy. He's lost 25 buy-ins. You'd think that was a losing player, right? If you look that up, it's going to tell you that his win rate is like minus 1.5 BB per 100. It's not. It's actually 3.32. That's just how easy it can be to fall grossly out with your observed, <clears throat> your true win rate. That's how easy it can be for your observed win rate to be very different from your true win rate, basically. It's kind of scary. <clears throat> And sometimes this will happen. Some of the very best poker players in the world or are perceived to be very best poker players in the world aren't actually that good. What's happened is they've played a couple of hundred thousand hands and they've run amazingly. And they're for some, you know, they're quite, you can understand why that why people think that they're amazing because they've made all this money and they've moved up in stakes and just ran really good, ran really good. They're probably decent. They're probably not players with like terrible loss rates or anything. But a lot of them, are not as good as they're perceived to be because their win rate is just a measure of mostly variance over a couple of hundred thousand hats. You see a guy that plays like a few million, um, then you're going to get a much better idea. Like we can play around with a sample now. Um, we can plug in like a million hands. Is that a million? One, two, three, four, five, six zeros. Yeah, I believe that's a million. Last time I checked, a million was six zeros. You can see here that this is the absolute worst case out of a thousand and the guy's still winning. It's still terrible, it's way below the median, but things are a lot more, things are still very different here over a million hands. You know, you can win 46,000 BBs or you can only win 21,000. That's a huge difference. So even guys who are playing a million hands, some of them are running much better than others. The guys who are, oh, this guy's a winner, he has this sick win rate. A lot of that, their standard deviation is high because they're playing six max zoom is due to variance. So my point is that there'll be players out there who are quite average, who are, perceived to be some of the best in the world if you're looking at it in a results orientated point of view so never like follow a coach just because of his win rate never accept coaching from someone just because they've crushed the game over like a hundred thousand three hundred thousand hands whatever a million hands only you know you want to hire a coach based on 
how well they explain things based on like their poker understanding and that that's much more of a usually much more of a a giveaway about how strong a player someone is is how they actually think about the game not their results so just be very skeptical about people who claim who have amazing results um if they, you're not convinced by the stuff they say that could well mean they're not as strong a player as their results suggest and um, by the same token you could have a player who has a very modest win rate um but is actually a very strong player and just hasn't run that good over a million hands so variance is just huge just you will underestimate it. It's natural to underestimate it. I've written articles about this, but in life, we're conditioned to lower variance environments. We're not used to like going out to get the shopping and just being like attacked by birds on the way to the shop and losing all of our shopping and our money. It doesn't happen very often, but in poker, that the equivalent of that happens all the time, and that's the difference. Realistically, a lot of you guys playing sort of on Bovada, playing like three tables at once, playing a couple hours a night, your variant, your variance is going to be even more extreme because your sample is going to be tiny. Like, say you play like five thousand hands a month, and I have students who actually do this, and I say to them, you need to get your volume up. And say you're a winner of the same win rate that I had, and say your standard deviation is the same. I mean, it's almost just fifty fifty. There are like as many losing samples here as there are winning ones, if not more. Um, like you just have no idea. If you're looking at your five K sample and you're saying I'm a winner, look I I've, I've got this win rate, it's just nonsense. You're just deluding yourself completely because we have no idea what your win rate is. We're not even close to figuring it out. You have a twenty K sample, you're barely any closer. Be in this game for the long haul. All you'll see as I increase this sample gradually is that it becomes progressively slightly less affected by variance, but still very affected. There's still gonna be a bunch of losing samples. You become less likely to be losing you know, if, if you play 150,000 hands with this sample, it's unlikely that you're going to lose. Absolutely. But it'll happen. One in 10 times. There we go. Two out of 20 samples there. One in 10. So what I like to do is I like to just go back to, you know, the sample that we we're looking at there. And I like to say, okay, I like to run this. And one thing you can do is get one that's quite an average spread. Like, there we go. That one's pretty, pretty brutal, pretty gruesome. And take a, take a picture of it and just have this as a, as an aid on screen, you can take a photo, and then what I like to do is basically bring that bring that picture up and use it in my session. So there'll be a space, if you're playing three tables, you'll have space for this. If you're playing a focus session, which is where I want my students to play less tables, um, with the view to having more time to think and implement in an in-game setting the stuff they'd be learning and coaching, then there'll always be space on the screen for some kind of aid, inspiration, range chart, reference guide, whatever. And this is one thing I use for the mental game. By looking at this, you can just basically see just how erratic and random variance is and how you shouldn't be upset when you lose like three buy-ins in a session because it's just completely out with your control most of the time that that happens. So with that said, let's jump into, into a session and just be very unresolved oriented about things and be happy that over this sample we're about to play on the camera, which is going to be about... 300 hands 400 hands probably in the next half hour um we're not in any way going to be able to control our results it's gonna we've already seen what a 10,000 hand sample looks like you know shred that by 30 and then you can just imagine how completely random this is going to be i am barely more likely to have a winning session than i am to have a losing session right now and that's what i need to bear in mind so that's why getting pissed off if i lose today is just completely futile, irrational, just has no logical purpose. It only serves to make me suffer when there's no reason to because I've not yet played anything close to a smidgen of a reliable sample. So so yeah, we'll talk about everything as as it occurs. Queen 10 here is not usually an open from the hijack, but I, okay, yeah, yeah, there's active three bears here. That should probably have actually been a fold. Um, they're active so far, small sample. The reason I open it is because I have this guy in the big blind who's a fish playing one table, shorter stack can just label him as such right away and here uh, this is a board that I'm going to just go ahead and just see bet with with my pretty much I think my whole range against the 1917 guy who doesn't seem too crazy so far I think I should be able to I have enough range advantage on this board that I can just fire a small c bet and get away with that this is a mandatory triple now I think on this texture I'll talk about why in just a second with this part of my range not with like everything of course um, normally a bit, a bit smaller there on table one actually just it's a board I'm going to range bet very small it's, I've been over this before in podcasts and videos it's just very difficult for my opponent to do anything against that strategy I wonder if we're just going to run really good again like we did last time we recorded it's normally like what's been happening recently 
Uh, so we're going to go ahead and just see bet here. Like two into three seems decent with middle set. If it's top set, there's a bit more um, incentive to slow play. But honestly, on King Queen X, I wouldn't be slow playing anything against the fish at all. It's just too likely that there's too many gut shots, straight draws, pair in his, in his range. If it was something like King 5-5 five, five and I pocket kings, I'm way more likely to check back there. I'm still not going to do it unless I know the fish is like aggro and going to stab at me because it doesn't really gain very much unless that's the case. Um, but there's way more incentive when you block the, the top part of the board, which represents the range your opponent's going to call multiple streaks with. It's okay to lose one streak of value against second pair, the thought being that you're not going to get three streaks anyway from that hand, but against top pair you may well be getting three, and therefore losing one streak of value against that hand is much worse. Your opponent will lead the turn, you can raise turn, but then you end up in all this kind of unbalanced territory. You're not really doing that with enough value hands to bluff, and it's not really a spot I want to be in. I'd much rather just be able to... Um, bet flop, bet turn, bet river. It's most of my value range. It's the best way to go for value and as a bluff. Jax is a flat against under the gun open from a tight looking net. 67 hands, 993. Pretty damn netty. So, and this, I would expect this to be for value almost all the time to be a range like ace king, queens plus, or something like that. If the guy knows this guy, if this guy is indeed that tight, it's a clear fold when he four bets because the net's just going to have like kings plus there. Like very, very often. So Jax is just going to be crushed by one of them almost all the time. It's going to go in the bin. They could both have Ace King, but that's like best case scenario and it's not even all that great. <clears throat> and it's actually kind of unlikely as well, I think, that you just snap four bets Ace King there being a net or that the button even three bets Ace King against the net. If he is indeed a net, of course, we have to take these small samples with a, with a grain of salt. I have a polar of 3-bet range here, I'm going to 3-bet hands such as this that are just a slightly too weak to call until my opponent shows me that he's over defending and in that, that case I'll switch to a linear range but in the big blind I'll always start out polarised and in the small blind I'll start out linear in these games A7 would be bloating, a 3-bet range is far too much if we turned that into a bluff so we're just going to fold it So what are we actually doing when we make decisions? Like, if decisions are so out with our control, like what happens? If in the short term we're just almost as likely to win as we are to lose, does it even matter what we do? Maybe like the kind of frustrating, irrational thought that you get when you start to fully um, experience variance. I just 2.5x there because the guy was like a nitty guy with a high 3-bet, so he's going to be playing very 3-bet or fold, and against that we exploit it by sizing down. Here we can size up because we have a fish in a small blind. <clears throat> Jack 8 here, too good to fold to him in open with that price in position with those pot odds, even if we have to fold every time we miss the flop, which we kind of do when we miss this badly, it's still going to be totally fine to defend the hand. Just going to check back Ace King here, try and get the showdown on the board. It's very hostile and not very not very comforting for me, so he's going to be all over that like a rash, so we'll just give up there, which is totally fine, and we'll just fold to the pot size C-bet, which seems way too big on that texture. Um, for the reason that he's just going to have a bunch of air in his range and so am I and betting big just serves to lose more money when I've actually connected and a lot of my range just plays for a full there of quite an inelastic range to sizing I would think. So <clears throat> so basically um, this thought that oh, it doesn't really matter what we do because it's just so subject to variance is not true because even though you're almost as likely to win as you are to lose in any given session, if you play better then that's you're like 52% going to win the session, 48% going to lose it, or maybe not even that high, it kind of depends. Um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. <coughs> you're like frogs in my throat, which is really irritating, so I'm trying to make a video, but I can't speak, it's always fun. Um, I don't even have a cold or anything, I don't know why, it's just like, when I need to come to make a video, this always happens. When I'm coaching someone, this like hardly ever happens, it's kind of bizarre. Anyway, so the, the point is that if you play badly and you say, oh, screw it, I don't care, I'll just do whatever. You may just like you have to beat the rake. So if you're just like as good as all your average opposition, you're like more way more likely to have a losing session by like two or three percent or something like that because of the rake. Uh, this guy could be a reg. People have started min opening under the gun these days as a strategy. I don't think it's good, but people seem to think it's good these days. Obviously, someone who ran good over a decent sample said that it was. <laughs> I do amuse myself sometimes with my hating on people who ran good over a decent sample and are respected as a great poker player for it, even though they're illogical. It does happen though. You know, you see that you see that quite a bit. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and over bluff this spot. I'm just gonna sque squeeze this hand. King nine is kinda close to a call, but I think we're just gonna fold it. And do six, I'm just gonna fold because there's two short stacks. 
in the blinds, which probably decreases my fold equity on average. I could have squeezed a bit bigger here. Actually, this guy's 3 3 over 32. I maybe don't want to actually um, have a squeeze bluffing range here at all yet against him. It could be a mistake. Obviously, we just fold to the 4 bit from the tight player. But basically, like if he's just a bit looser, I kind of didn't realize he was quite that tight. If he's a bit looser, it's going to be absolutely fine because although nets open kind of tight, they also fold a lot of their range to three bets as well. This guy seems like on the tight side, so it's going to like grossly over open our small blind there. We're probably not quite justified in doing that yet, actually, but oh well, gets us into more situations for the video. So basically, yeah, what you're doing when you make a good poker decision is you're making it ever so slightly likely, more likely that you're, that's a plus EV decision or that you're going to profit in that one hand. And then when you spun that out over loads and loads of hands, it just becomes way more likely that you have a winning session, uh, that you have a winning stretch over like a 50k, 100k sample. So it's just rinse and repeat, it's consistency, it's just doing the same thing all the time until you make it likely that you're going to win money, basically. So every micro decision doesn't matter hugely on its own, but put together, it does matter hugely, and it has a massive effect on what's going to happen over a big sample like this. Um, this is kind of weird, the guy calls flop and leads turn. Just try to think where we are in our range here. I don't think we need to defend to this because we're not going to see about everything on this flop. But yeah, I think we can just about fold ace jack. No, no draw, no flush draw there. I don't think it equates to like overfolding our range too dramatically, which is just the, the thing we need to be a bit careful about. But also, even if we're in, like leaving balance for a second there, I don't even think we should be balanced. I think when someone calls king queen x two tone and leads turn, they are very rarely bluffing a low equity hand, they very rarely have like an underpair there, they either have some kind of draw with good equity against us anyway, or they have some kind of, is that a fish in the big blind there? Let's check my table, he's playing a 4, no it's a reg, so we men open, always good to check that if you don't know who you're up against, some regs still don't hide from search, most fish don't hide from search, so yeah, 10s is a clear check call here, against cutoff we're just way too high up in our range to fold, so we're going to flat there. We're going to be floating that board with some backdoor draws and stuff as well. It's a flop that people are going to one and done a fair amount. On the river here, we're just going to check again. We're going to check call. We do need some check calling range when we play this way. We have some like ace highs and stuff. Um, so there'll be some weaker hands in our flop check call range as well. We don't necessarily want to bet. I could turn tens into a value bet on that river as well. That would be reasonable. Certainly, it's kind of close. In fact, it may be a value bet and I just check all weaker stuff. The thought that weaker stuff, the thought is that weaker stuff like ace queen has about as much showdown value against his betting range as tens. Okay, tens is a bit more in case he wants to thin value bet like eights or nines or something, but it's not not by loads. Um, again, a range bet situation for me with queen nine here. I'm just going to bet small with our whole range. And in this spot here, we're going to probably bet our whole range here as well. I'm going to bet really small against the fish. Well, I assume it's a fish. It's a really short stack. So I'm just one and done here against a shorter stack. Usually when they call this flop, your fold equity is very limited on the turn. So we're just not going to mess with this. And easy 3-bet for value with ace-queen, blind versus blind. And we're going to open here because this looks like a tight fish so far. It may not be, it could be a looser fish, it's almost certainly a fish though, silver star not full stacked. And again we'll just go with our strategy of just c-betting really wide and really small here. On a board that's sufficiently dry against a weaker player, this only needs to work a third of the time. It should, we should reach that target comfortably in a vacuum and I'm not bothered about being unbalanced with my range there against a weaker player so much. So we'll just go ahead and overbluff that flop considerably. Out of position, I wouldn't be able to get away with that against a reg. Like I said before, I'd range bet a dry board like that in position. Uh, queen 10 here. Hijack against small blind, kind of close. Where am I in my range? This is probably just about foldable, but not by much. Um, Fines against under the gun. On the button, I think I can just about call here. It doesn't get squeezed so often against under the gun. I do have the button, which is the best position, of course, so it's probably fine just to call. And mostly be set mining, but there will be times when this kind of tight looking 2217 guy just gives up post flop and I'm able to win the pot as well. I'm not going to stab here three way, I don't have enough fold equity. Um, get three bet here by someone who appears to be pretty nitty over this sample. Oh, wait, this is my student. I know this guy. He always seems like a big net on my HUD actually. Um, so expect his three bet range here to be like polarized. I should be dominating the bluffs that, he, that I've taught him to use in this situation, so I think I can call his queen off against him with these with the reads that I have. I'm going to check call this flop um, with this hand and also a bunch of my overpairs and stuff as well I'm going to have here. I'm going to have like eights, nines, tens, jacks, queens, no probably jacks at the top of my range here. Um, I'm going to range check this turn because it's better for him than it's for me and I'm just going to check call twice and it strengthens my check call range on this texture. 
He's going to have Ace-King here sometimes as well. I don't really want to, like, raise and stack off. And now on the river, I can have some air here. I can have, like, King-Queen and King-Jack suited and stuff like that. So we'll go ahead and bet this part of our range pretty big for value because of that and see how Ginge wants to play. This is actually the student that appeared in this series um, with us before. And he goes ahead and mucks. So that's a moral victory for the carrot man. And I'm going to say that I'm going to take a deduct a session from him. Um, for losing that hand to me, I think that's only fair. Like if he's gonna, if he's gonna call me on that. Have the audacity to call me on that river that he gets one less coaching session for it. I see what he had. Ace five. Yeah, I mean, I think he played the hand okay. I might, I might just see about that flop. I think it's like pretty good for. Like I don't think my range is too strong. There I have a lot of overcards that I've just missed. He does have the backdoor flush draw with an overcard, so I feel that should probably be part of his. Um, see bet range. I can bet this flop a bit bigger actually here because I'm not going to see bet that this flop that often. Actually, I should probably just check this flop. <clears throat> I, I like to turn my hand into a bluff because it's a bit too weak to to bet here, but I think it's it's whatever. Sorry, a bit too weak to check and actually head to showdown with. Like the showdown value is very poor, so I like to just turn it into a see bet bluff, which I think is actually fine. But I, I can bet bigger because I'm more polarized there. I'm not like see betting that board with my whole range. So it's fairly good for him as well, so it's not like I have an enormous range advantage on that flop. Like he has a lot of options there to defend, he has higher equity floats and stuff like that, so it prohibits me from just c-betting my entire range, basically. As I would on a drier board in that situation. So yeah, I think my student should probably be um, c-betting that flop. Other than that, I think he played the hand fine, it's a clear call on the river. Um, I actually quite like his turn check as well. It strengthens his... I mean, the thing is, on that turn, he probably doesn't have too many overpairs, given the way he plays the flop. So he is kind of going to be kind of polarised between um, just air and then, like, ace-x, which kind of caters towards him having a, a more of a, a betting strategy on the turn rather than a checking strategy because his air needs to bet, and the more ace-x he bets, the more air um, he can bet as well. So it might even be better that he just bets turn their checks river. Um, if we think about what his range looks like in that situation. I'm going to call sixes because on this table, like, okay, I've got like a 43% three better, but that sample's tiny. Never take that literally. It's an under the gun opener. I expect to be able to set mine profitably in position here. So, yep. Ace three, easy open here under the gun. It's a wheel ace. It's very playable and it's efficient in the small blind, which makes us want to open up our range a bit more. And I'm just going to check full jack, jack, deuce, two tone here. I don't have the backdoor flush draw and I've only got one over card. I don't think it's a part of my range. I really want to be want to be betting, and I think I'm just going to go ahead and, what queens does he have, ace-queen, can I bet turn bet river with this part of my range? It's probably okay to, I mean it's not, yeah, a lot of my range improves here, I'm going to go ahead and bet turn bet river here, I think it should be fine, just trying to get him off, like, because that turns so quickly, like under pairs and stuff like that, you can have some draws that I've missed, I feel like this needs to be a follow through, um, not like thrilled about it, I'm going to get called here every time he has queen x, but he could well just have under pairs and stuff that are folding here, and I rep a bunch of Queen X, and I'm just balancing that with my bluffs, I think it's okay. Not super pumped about that part of my range being a turn bet, river bet, after checking flop, because it has bad turn equity, but I think I just, my flop checking range has enough Queen X in it that my range becomes sufficiently strong on the turn that I can go ahead and bet there um, with Ace-3. I always see that guy and I'm like, like my student and I'm always like, oh yeah, he's such a net this guy, but he's not actually, he's just been running like kind of tight over the sample that, that I've got on him basically. I mean, I think his play is fine. Depends what his 3-bet range actually is pre-flop. I'd imagine he's probably 3-betting something like Queen's plus or Jack's plus Ace King against me there, which means that he's got enough room for bluffs that he can easily use like his Ace-3, his Ace-5 suited, which is actually the best of the wheel aces anyway. I'm going to go ahead and just squeeze Ace Jack, I think it's really standard. Squeeze can go a bit bigger here because you do get called a bit more often in the spot with smaller sizing. Jack Deuce is on the fringe of an open or not an open against what seems to be two regs. And we get called in two spots here, which is a little bit alarming. Um, this combo doesn't have any back doors. It's kind of close. Three way, I think it's just a give up your ace jack without any back doors. I think with a back door, I'd go ahead and start see betting because then there's a lot more turn options for me. I'm going to like not to bet Jack Deuce on this um, flop. on, And I'm going to like to actually 
again, this is a similar spot where I'm a little bit polarized between ace-x and air, so I think my stabbing should mostly come on the turn because I bet most of my ace-x here, and I want to bet as many bluffs as possible, so I think I should just basically go ahead and bet this turn. And I can't follow through with all my air combos on the river, otherwise I'm just going to be too unbalanced towards bluffs. So I think that this hand does block ace-jack, which is one hand that... I guess I'm not really worried about ace-jack, I think it 3-bets pre most of the time. I think I'd rather have like a 10 in my hand here to be a good blocker to bet river with. Um, I don't block any flush draws. The jack is like kind of useful, I guess, because it does block ace-jack those times that he does have it. Um, hmm. I'd rather have two blockers, like a jack and a 10 or something. I feel like if I'm if I'm betting my ace-jack off my jack, whatever that was, jack rag, that I'm probably just betting too much. As a bluff there. Remember that if I'm betting that river like two thirds spot, I can only have like twenty eight percent of my range actually be bluffs. This is either a misclick or the nuts, and so with aces, I think I just need to target the times. It's like he's gonna fold here, or whatever. If this is a misclick, um, but I think it's too likely with a, a net here. This is just like kings every time, if not the other one combo of aces. So I think we'll just go ahead and four bet and try and get the money all in pre flop exploitatively, like. He just snap folds, I guess, it was just a misclick there. Um, yeah, it's like the only hand I would 4-bet, so my 4-bet range is literally aces in that spot, but I just feel like the guy is so unbalanced anyway, it doesn't really matter. 10-8 suited term, I'm going to like to flat this a little bit deeper against the fish in position. That's probably going to be fine. I don't think that guy is a fish, don't know why he's tagged as such on table 3. I feel like this hand is close to actually being a 3-bet, just for isolation purposes. Fish checks this flop, we'll go ahead and stab. We have some back doors and not much showdown value, so... Hopefully he's just a fair fold fish and we'll tag him as such when he does just fold there. Queen, deuce here. It's not a million miles away from a call. It's probably callable, just getting insane pot odds, although it's not like super happy. Another spot where we want to just range better really small on his flop, because it's really hard for our opponent to do anything about that. And we'll just bet three streets of value here, basically. Bet 250 on the turn, and we'll just check this flop to the under the gun opener. And we'll go ahead and just check fold that flop, and we'll just bet three streets here. Again, I like to make my river sizing pretty big. It allows me to have more bluffs here. That makes my opponent more indifferent to bluff catching. It makes it harder for him to just bluff catch all day. Uh, yeah, so... Any questions or comments about these spots, let me know. You guys have been very quiet throughout this series. I've had like a couple of people posting and giving regular feedback apart from that. It's not been so much, so please do continue to... Or start leaving feedback if you don't already. If you've got questions about the way I've played a hand that I've not really gone over... Um, let me know and I'll, and I'll cover it in the comments for sure. I'm very happy to do that. 9 7 here, I elected to defend just because this guy's a weaker player and it can flop the nuts and it can stack him and I'm getting a good price to achieve those things. So, ace x, I'll just check here and try and get the showdown and chop a tiny pot, that's fine. Um, yep, just, so just playing kind of fit or fold there with 9 7, accepting the good pot odds, accepting that I'm going to lose the pot most of the time. Um, but when I hit, there's enough implied odds to justify the call. Jack 10 is a really easy fold against the 3 bit there. And 10-7, because the button's tight, I'm going to just mid-open my cutoff. With my whole cutoff range, that is not just with 10-7 of diamonds. Guys, a donking range on this flop. Um, kind of weird. Do I want a raising range against this donk? I don't know, honestly. I don't know what this means in the population. I don't think many people would like donk here. He could be a reg with a donking game, but he probably has a lot of equity when he donks. Like, I think it's an overfold to fold here, just about. Not by loads, but it is definitely an overfold to fold middle pair there. But I feel like people aren't donking without like decent equity there, so it's just going to be minus EV, frankly, to defend that hand. I think if he was donking, like, I don't think I want to make it like indifferent to just donking random two cards there. So I just don't think he is. And it's really hard for me to make him indifferent to donking like a hand like king x with a flush draw there it's just going to be plus eb for him to do that it's not much i can do about it because he has a lot of equity with that hand i'm going to just call jack nine here against what's probably a weaker player opening from under the gun he's gold star min opening um in position we can get multiple pots which catered to this hand pretty well i just like to get into a lot of situations in position against weaker players it's going to make a lot of money that way so ace king is obviously the hand we need to worry about here i don't see any reason to raise i think it's just way too thin um, I think it's just a very standard call, three streets. And um, we're going to just check back with the King 10 here and start value betting now that we get there. Um, it's just tempting to raise fold, honestly. 
pocket nines. I mean, we block nines considerably. I'm thinking you can have like sets and stuff here. It's just the trouble is I don't really have much air in my range. Who are you? I'm going to make a small raise fold for value here. Kind of sucks to get shipped on, but I mean, I don't know why I'm looking at other than 16 combos of Ace King here. If I get shoved on, I don't really know. I hope no one ever shoves those three combos of pocket nines. I think it's a value raise anyway. It's got to assume this is a weaker player who's going to pay off like a set or two pair. Does it not show you the hand anymore? Like, the history. Okay, so he just like bet calls off bottom two there, which is really horrible. I mean, I just don't have much air and he's just overcalling his betting range on that river pretty substantially. Doesn't really have many bluffs on that river at all, so Jack 10 actually represents quite low down his range there, I would think. He has the straights, he has all the other good stuff. So clear value raise, I think, for us anyway, even though we're not like super pumped about it. Even though it's kind of hard against someone decent to get paid off by many more sands there, because our range is very airless as well. But then against a good player, we can actually turn things into bluffs there. If he's going to make that sizing only with his like less than straight hands, then it becomes very easy for us to just go into um, over bluff town and make some and just raise the river like pretty big and turn a lot of hands into bluffs as well. In that spot, it was, as it was, it was a guy that men opened under the gun, so I don't really think it is a weaker player, so I'm just going to play exploitatively in a vacuum and just raise for value and not really care, and probably raise fold grudgingly. But I don't expect to get shoved on by much other than Ace-King there. Maybe nine sometimes, but that's only three combos, whereas there's 16 of Ace-King, so if he does shove an exclusively straight X, or straight X, is that even a word, a term? If he only shoves straights into the river, I'm crushed, basically, because he has Ace-King. You know, good like four times, five times more often than he has in pocket nines. Just combat thoroughly, and that's something you guys should definitely try and get comfortable with is using combos in that way. Just gonna bet three against the random fish here. When he calls flop really quickly, I'm gonna bet turn really big because I think he's just gonna call turn a lot there. Um, obviously, I was wrong, but in general, that should be the pattern. Right, I'm gonna go ahead and sit out and wrap up this video. The main thing to take away from this is just that I'm thinking about these decisions very objectively. I'm totally aware that in the short term anything can happen. It's a long term game. Um, I think it's just too cheeky to go ahead and 4-bet bluff this hand. Like it's probably okay to be honest, but he doesn't fold the 4-bets very much, 33%. I do like to over bluff that spot against the population, but if I bluff King-10 off, like it's just ridiculous over bluffing. Like it's absolutely absurd how many um, value combos I actually have there. It's just so insignificant compared to all my bluffs. I'm going to go ahead and just min open this button. This is like a tight looking fish. See so short stack, he may not be a fish, he may just be one of these regs that plays with a half stack, I don't know. But in anyway, I should have enough fold equity. I'm gonna go ahead and just snap bet a dollar on this board. Bam. Um, what's going on here? Donking seems to be coming back into fashion. Did someone with Ran Good say that donking was a good thing? He min open min raises me here? That's kind of disgusting. I mean he's probably just got air a bunch. Oh, he's playing four tables. What the hell? A reg min raising me here. King high is probably high enough in my range I can't fold. <laughs> Funnily enough, I just folded that hand that I shouldn't have folded because I timed down, but that happens. Okay, now we can fold. And it's just like when we get min opened in that, on that um, board and I have an overcard and I have king high, like he is literally, his risk reward is so great that to make him indifferent, I have to call like the vast majority of my range, which unfortunately for me is the vast majority of any two cards. Um, but I think it's just such a bizarre, full of shit line that I don't expect it to be value heavy or be in balance to value that often so I don't want to under defend my range there I want to just defend as much of it as is balanced there so I think I have to just like peel one there with the king high although it's kind of uncomfortable I can fold that turn because a lot of my range improves and stuff it's not a problem as long as I don't over overfold there he's not going to exploit me by um, bluff raising his really weak range on that on that board ace three here I think people do overfold this spot a bit so I'm just going to like go ahead and be a bit more exploitable, a bit more bluff heavy than is balanced in this situation. Easy fold with the queen four. Um, on this texture, like I do have, my range here is basically, just to give you guys a picture, is going to be uh, king-queen, ace-jack combos. A lot of these want to check back, so I do want a substantial checking range in this flop. My value range, kings and aces, doesn't mind checking back one here either as well. I think a lot of my range just wants to check back this texture, to be honest. Um, there's not a lot of it that like, loves betting here or anything, so we'll go ahead and check. Um, we could consider turning this into a bluff now. My king queen just improves. My pocket queens and my pocket aces could maybe bet twice as well. He checks turn very quickly. Yeah, I think I'm just going to go ahead and bet twice with this ace three here. It's very close to the bottom of my range, so it should be a bluff, I think. Um, 
flop should maybe be a bet there. I just went for a check just to like strengthen my check back range there a little bit with the mediocre jack. Then I'll bet two streets of value when he checks again. I think that's fine. Slightly vulnerable hand, so betting is probably a bit better there actually. I do like to strengthen the checking range, but people just fold so much when they check there that just betting like ridiculously wide for value and as a bluff is probably just good to get the benefit of protection with my value range as well. Man, the weather here is so miserable. It was weird because it was like 15 degrees Celsius the other day in Glasgow in December, which is just bizarre, but it's like raining all the time. I kind of want to go for like a run and stuff and like get fixed. I've just been like lying around and hiding from the miserable rain all the time, which is kind of nice and cozy, but also not really good for like your fitness. So I might just brave it later and just go out into the icy cold and just like, as temperature's dropped again now, just go for that run, just do it. Okay, so we're just playing our last three hands here and then we're going to wrap up the session. Hope that was enjoyable to watch. Leave me any questions about um, variants, about the theory that we did at the start or about um, indeed any of the hands that were played there. Um, do get in touch and leave me feedback on the thread. Okay, be taking on a bunch of students over the new year by the way, so if you are looking for coaching, just get in touch with me at admin at and we can chat about, about setting up a package or whatnot. And yeah, hope to hear from you guys. Have an awesome Christmas, New Year, run good over the festive season and get that money. See you guys in the next video.